the american rivals of sherlock holmes the man higher up by william mackirk and adrian bomber part one the first real pleasure of the winter had burst upon New York from the Atlantic. For seventy-two hours, as Rentland, file clerk in the broad offices of the American Commodities Company, saw, from the record he was making for President Welter, no ship of any of the dozen expected from foreign ports had been able to make the company's docks in Brooklyn, or indeed had been reported at Sandy Hook and for the last five days during which the weather bureau storm signals had stayed steadily set no steamer of the six which had finished unloading at the docks the week before had dared to try for the open sea except one the elizabethan age which had cleared the narrows on monday night on land the storm was scarcely less disastrous to the business of the great importing company since tuesday morning Grantland's reports of the car and trainload consignments, which had left the warehouses daily, had been a monotonous page of trains told. But until that Friday morning, Welter, the big bull-necked, tickle-lipped master of man and money, had borne all the accumulated trouble of the week with serenity, almost with contempt. Only when the file clerk added to his report the minor item that the three thousand ton steamer, Elizabethan age, which had cleared on Monday night, had been driven into Boston. Something suddenly seemed to break in the inner office. Rantlin heard the President's secretary telephone to Brooklyn for Rowan, the dock superintendent. He heard Walter's heavy steps going to and fro in the private office. His hoarse voice raised angrily, and soon afterwards Rowan blustered in. Rantlin could no longer overhear the voices. He went back to his own private office and called the station master at the Grand Central Station on the telephone. The seven o'clock train from Chicago, the clerk asked in a guarded voice. It came in at ten thirty as expected. Oh, at ten ten. Thank you. He hung up the receiver and opened the door to pass a word with Rowan as he came out of the president's office. They have wired that the Elizabethan age could not get beyond Boston, Rowan. He cried curiously. The hooker. The dog superintendent had gone strangely white. For the imperceptible fraction of an instant, his eyes dimmed with fear, as he stared into the wondering face of the clerk. But he recovered himself quickly, spat offensively, and slammed the door as he went out. Rantlin stood with glancing hands for a moment. Then he glanced at the clock, and hurried to the entrance of the outer office. The elevator was just bringing up from the street a red-haired, blue-gray-eyed young man of medium height, who, noting with a quick, intelligent glance the arrangement of the offices, advanced directly toward President Welter's door. The chief clerk stepped forward quickly. You are Mr. Trent? Yes. I am Rentland. This way, please. He led the psychologist to the little room behind the files, where he had telephoned the moment before. Your wire to me in Chicago, which brought me here, said Trent, turning from the inscription, file clerk, on the door to the dogged, decisive features and weary form of his client, gave me to understand that he wished to have me investigate the disappearance or death of two of your dog scale checkers. I suppose you are acting for President Welter of whom I have heard, in sending for me. No, said Rentland, as he waved Trent to a seat. President Welter is certainly not troubling himself to that extent over an investigation. Then the company or some other officer? Trent questioned, with increasing curiosity. No, nor the company nor any other officer in it, Mr. Trent. Rentland smiled. Nor even am I as file clerk of the American Commodities Company, over troubling myself about those checkers. He leaned nearer to Trent, confidentially, but as a special agent for the United States Treasury Department, I am extremely interested in the death of one of these men, and in the disappearance of the other. 
and for that I called you to help me. As a secret agent for the government, Trent repeated, with rapidly rising interest. Yes, a spy, if you wish to call me, but as truly in the ranks of the enemies to my country as any Nathan Hale, who has a statue in this city. Today the enemies are the big corrupting thieving corporations like this company, and appreciating that, I am not ashamed to be a spy in their ranks, commissioned by the government to catch and condemn President Walter and any other officers involved with him for systematically stealing from the government for the past ten years, and for probable connivance in the murder of at least one of those two checkers, so that the company might continue to steal. To steal? How? Customs frauds, theft, smuggling, anything you wish to call it. Exactly what or how, I can't tell. For that is part of what I sent for you to find out. For a number of years the Customs Department has suspected, upon circumstantial evidence, that the enormous profits of this company upon the thousand and one things which it is importing and distributing must come, in part from goods they have got through without paying the proper duty. So, at my own suggestion, I entered the employ of the company a year ago to get track of the method. But after a year here, I was almost ready to give up the investigation in despair. When Ed Lenders, the company's checker on the dogs, in scale house number three was killed, accidentally, the coroner's jury said. To me, it looked suspiciously like murder. Within two weeks, Morse, who was appointed as checker in his place, suddenly disappeared. The company's officials showed no concern as to the fate of these two men, and my suspicions that something crooked might be going on at scale house number three were strengthened. And I sent for you to help me to get at the bottom of the things. Is it not best then to begin by giving me as fully as possible the details of the employment of Morris and Landers, and also of their disappearances? The young psychologist suggested. I have told you these things here, Trent, rather than take you to some safer place. The secret agent replied, because I have been waiting for someone who can tell you what you need to know better than I can. Edith Rowan, the stepdaughter of the dock superintendent, knew Landers well, for he boarded at Rowan's house. She was, or is, if he still lives, engaged to Morse. It is an unusual thing for Rowan himself to come here to see President Walter, as he did just before you came. But every morning, since Morse disappeared, his daughter has come to see Walter personally. She is already waiting in the outer office. Opening the door, he indicated to Trant a light-haired, overdressed, nervous girl, twisting about uneasily on the seat outside the president's private office. Walter thinks it policy, for some reason, to see her a moment every morning, but she always comes out almost at once, crying. This is interesting, Trent commented, as he watched the girl go into the president's office. After only a moment she came out, crying. Redland had already left his room, so it seemed by chance that he and Trent met and supported her to the elevator, and over the slippery pavement to the neat electric coupe which was standing at the curb. It's hers, said Drentland, as Trent hesitated before helping the girl into it. It is one of the things I wanted you to see. Broadway is very slippery, Miss Rowan. You will let me see you home again this morning. This gentleman is Mr. Trent, a private detective. I want him to come along with us. The girl echoed, and Trent crowded into the little automobile. Rand turned the coupe skillfully out into the swept path of the street, ran swiftly down Fifth Avenue to Fourteenth Street, and stopped three streets to the east before a house in the middle of the block. The house was as narrow and cramped and as cheaply constructed as its neighbors on both sides. It had lace curtains conspicuous in every window, and impressive statues with vases and gaudy bits of bric-a-brac in the front rooms. He told me again that Will must still be off drunk, and Will never takes a drink. She spoke to them for the first time, as they entered the little sitting room. 
He is Walter, Randall explained to Trent. Will is Morse, the missing man. Now, Miss Rowan, I have brought Mr. Trent with me, because I have asked him to help me find Morse for you, as I promised. And I want you to tell him everything you can about how Landers was killed and how Morse disappeared. And remember, Trent interposed, that I know very little about the American Commodities Company. Why, Mr. Trent, the girl gathered herself together. You cannot help knowing something about the company. It imports almost everything. Tobacco, sugar, coffee, wines, olives, and preserved fruits, oils, and all sorts of table delicacies. From all over the world, even from Borneo, Mr. Trent, and from Madagascar and New Zealand. It has big warehouses at the docks with millions of dollars worth of goods stored in them. My stepfather has been with the company for years and has charge of all that goes on at the docks. Including the weighing? Yes, everything on which there is a duty when it is taken off, the boats has to be weighed. Then to do this there are big scales, and for each one a scale house. When a scale is being used, there are two men in the scale house. One of these is the government weigher, who sets the scale to a balance and notes down the weight in a book. The other man, who is an employee of the company, writes the weight also in a book of his own, and he is called the company's checker. But though there are half a dozen scales, almost everything, when it is possible, is unloaded in front of scale number three, for that is the best part for shapes. And lenders? Landers was the company's checker on scale number three. Well, about five weeks ago, I began to see that Mr. Landers was troubled about something. Twice, a queer, quiet little man with his car on his cheek came to see him, and each time they went up to Mr. Landers' room and talked a long while. Ed's room was over the sitting room, and after the man had gone, I could hear him walking back and forth, walking and walking, until it seemed as though he would never stop. I told father about this man, who troubled Mr. Landers, and he asked him about it. But Mr. Landers flew into a rage, and said it was nothing of importance. Then one night, it was a Wednesday, everybody stayed late at the docks to finish unloading the steamer Covello. About two o'clock, father got home, but Mr. Landers had not been ready to come with him. He did not come all that night, and the next day he did not come home. Now, Mr. Trent, they are very careful at the warehouses about who goes in and out, because so many valuable things are stored there. On one side the warehouse is open onto the docks, and at each end they are fenced off so that you cannot go along the docks and get away from them that way. And on that other side they open onto the street through great driveway doors and at every door, as long as it is open, there stands a watchman, who sees everybody that goes in and out. Only one door was open that Wednesday night. The watchman there had not seen Mr. Landers go out. And the second night passed, and he did not come home. But the next morning, Friday morning, the girl caught her breath hysterically. Mr. Landers' body was found in the engine room back of scale house number three with the face crossed in horribly. Was the engine room occupied? said Trent quickly. It must have been occupied in the daytime, and probably on the night when Landers disappeared, as they were unloading the Covello. But on the night after which the body was found, was it occupied that night? I don't know, Mr. Trent. I think it could not have been. For, after the verdict of the coroner's jury, which was that Mr. Landers had been killed by some part of the machinery, it was said that the accident must have happened either the evening before, just before the engineer shut off his engines, or the first thing that morning, just after he had started them, for otherwise somebody in the engine room would have seen it. But where had Landers been all day Thursday, Miss Rowan, from two o'clock on the second night before, when your father last saw him, until the accident in the engine room? It was supposed he had been drunk. When his body was found, his clothes were covered with fibers from the coffee sacking, and the jury supposed he had been slipping off his liquor in the coffee warehouse during Thursday. But I had known Ed Landers for almost three years, and in all that time I never knew him to take even one drink. 
then it was a very unlikely supposition. You do not believe in that accident, Miss Rowan, Trent said brusquely. The girl grew white as paper. Oh, Mr. Trent, I don't know. I did believe in it. But since Will, Mr. Morse, has disappeared in exactly the same way, under exactly the same circumstances, and everyone acts about it exactly the same way, you say the circumstances of Morse's disappearances were the same. Trent pressed quietly when she was able to proceed. After Mr. Landers had been found dead, said the girl, pulling herself together again, Mr. Morse, who had been checker in one of the other scale houses, was made checker at scale number three. We were surprised at that, for it was a sort of promotion, and father did not like Will. He had been greatly displeased at our engagement. Will's promotion made us very happy, for it seemed as though father must be changing his opinion. But after Will had been checker on scale number three only a few days, the same choir, quiet little man, with the scar on his cheek, who had begun coming to see Mr. Landers before he was killed, began coming to see Will too. And after he began coming, Will was troubled, terribly troubled, I could see, but he would not tell me the reason. And he expected, after that man began coming, that something would happen to him. And I know, from the way he acted and spoke about Mr. Landers, that he thought he had not been accidentally killed. One evening, when I could see he had been more troubled than ever before, he said that if anything happened to him, I was to go at once to his boarding house and take charge of everything in his room and not to let anyone into the room to search it until I had removed everything in the bureau drawers. Everything, no matter how useless anything seemed. Then the very next night, five days ago, just as while Mr. Landers was checker, everybody stayed overtime at the docks to finish unloading a vessel the Elizabethan age. And in the morning, Will's landlady called me on the phone to tell me that he had not come home. Five days ago, Mr. Trant, and since then no one has seen or heard from him. And the watchman did not see him come out of the warehouse that night, just as he did not see me at Landers. What did you find in Morse's bureau? asked Trant. I found nothing. Nothing, Trant repeated. That is impossible, Miss Rowan. Think again. Remember, he warned you that what you find might seem trivial and useless. The girl, a little defiantly, studied for an instant Trant's clear-cut features. Suddenly she arose and ran from the room, but returned quickly with a strange little implement in her hand. It was merely a bit of wire, straight for perhaps three inches, and then bent in a half-circle of five or six inches the bad portion of the wire being wound carefully with stout twine, does, except for his clothes and some blank writing paper and envelopes, that was absolutely the only thing in the bureau. It was the only thing at all in the only locked drawer. Trant and Randland stared disappointedly at the strange implement, which the girl handed to the psychologist. You have shown this to your stepfather, Miss Rowan, for a possible explanation of why a company checker should be so solicitous about such a thing as this, asked Trent. Now, the girl hesitated. Will had told me not to say anything, and I told you father did not like Will. He had made up his mind that I was to marry at Landers. In most ways, father is kind and generous. He has kept the coop we came here in for mother and me for two years, and you see, she gestured a little proudly about the bedecked and badly furnished rooms. You see how he gets everything for us. Mr. Landers was most generous, too. He took me to the theatres two or three times every week. Always the best seats, too. I didn't want to go, but father made me. I preferred Will, though he wasn't so generous. Trent's eyes returned, with more intelligent scrutiny, to the mysterious implement in his hand. What salary do checkers receive, Fredland? He asked in a low tone. One hundred and twenty-five dollars a month. And her father, the dog superintendent, how much? Trans expressive glance, now jumping about from one gaudy extravagant trifle in the room to another, caught a glimpse again of the electric coupe standing in the street, then returned to the teeny bit of wire on his hand. Three thousand a year, Randall replied. Tell me, Miss Rowan, said Trent, this implement, 
Have you by any chance mentioned it to President Walter? Why, no, Mr. Trent. You are sure of that? Excellent, excellent. Now the choir, quiet little man with the scar on his cheek, who came to see Morris, no one could tell you anything about him. No one, Mr. Trent. But yesterday, Wood's landlady told me that a man has come to ask for Will every forenoon since he disappeared, and she thinks this may be the man with the scar, though she can't be sure, for he kept the collar of his overcoat up about his face. She was to telephone me if he came again. If he comes this morning, Trent glanced quickly at his watch, you and I, Rentland, might much better be waiting for him over there. The psychologist rose, putting the band twine wound bit of wire carefully into his pocket, and a minute later the two men crossed the street to the house, already known to Rentland, where Morse had boarded. The landlady not only allowed them to wait in her little parlour, but waited with them until at the end of an hour she pointed with an eager gesture to a short man in a big ulster who turned sharply up the front steps. That's him, see, she exclaimed. That man with the scar, cried Trentland. Well, I know him. He made for the door, caught at the ulster, and pulled the little man into the house by main force. Well, Dickie, the secret isn't challenged, as the man faced him in startled recognition. What are you doing in this case? Trent, this is Inspector Dickey of the Customs Office. He introduced the officer. I am in the case on my own hook. If I know what case you are talking about, piped Dickey. Morse, eh? And the American Commodities Company, eh? Exactly, said Randland brusquely. What were you calling to Selanders for? You know about that? The little man looked up sharply. Well, six weeks ago, Landers came to me and told me he had something to tell a secret system forbidding the customs. But before he got to terms, he began losing his nerve a little. He got it back, however, and was going to tell me when, all at once, he disappeared, and two days later he was dead. That made it hotter for me, so I went after Morse. But Morse denied he knew anything. Then Morse disappeared, too. So you got nothing at all out of them, Rentland interposed. Nothing I could use. Landers, one time, he was getting off his nerve, showed me a piece of band wire, with string around it in his room, and began telling me something when Ruan called him in, and then he shut up. A band wire, Trent cried eagerly, like this. He took from his pocket the implement given him by Edith Ruan. Morse had this in his room, the only thing in a locked drawer. The same thing, Dickie cried, seizing it. So Morse had it too after he became checker at scale number three, where the cheating is, if anywhere. The very thing Lander started to explain to me and how they cheated the customs with it. I say we must have it now, Redland. We need only to go to the docks and watch them while they weigh, and see how they use it, and arrest them, and then we have them at last, eh, old man? He cried in triumph. We have them at last. You mean, Trent Cotton upon the customs man that you can convict and jail perhaps the checker, or a foreman, or maybe even a dock superintendent, as usual. But the man higher up, the big man, who were really at the bottom of this business, and the only ones worth getting, will you catch him? We must take those who we can, said Dickie sharply. Trent laid his hand on a little officer's arm. I am a stranger to you, he said, but if you have followed some of the latest criminal cases in Illinois, Perhaps you know that, using the methods of modern practical psychology, I have been able to get results where old ways have failed. We were front of front now at perhaps the greatest problem of modern criminal catching, to catch in cases involving a great corporation, not only the little man, low down, who performed the criminal acts, but the man higher up, who conceive or connive at the criminal scheme. Redland, I did not come here to convict merely a dark foreman. But if we are going to reach anyone higher than that, you must not let Inspector Dickey excite suspicion by prying into matters at the docks this afternoon. But what else can we do? said Randland doubtfully. Modern practical psychology gives a dozen possible ways for proving the knowledge of the man higher up in this corporation crime. Trant answered, And I am considering which is the most practicable. Only tell me, he demanded suddenly, Mr. Walter, I have heard, is one of the rich men of New York, 
who make it a fad to give largely to universities and other institutions. Can you tell me with what ones he may be most closely interested? I have heard, Randland replied, that he is one of the patrons of the Stuvation School of Science. It is probably the most fashionably patroned institute in New York, and Walter's name I knew figures with it in the newspapers. Nothing could be better, Trant exclaimed. Kuno Schmelz has his psychological laboratory there. I see my way now, Randland, and you will hear from me early in the afternoon. But keep away from the docks. He turned and left the astonished customs officers abruptly. Half an hour later, the young psychologist sent in his card to Professor Schmelz in the laboratory of the Stuyvesant School of Science. The German, broad faced spectacled, beaming, himself came to the laboratory door. Is it Mr. Trent, the young apt pupil of my old friend Dr. Rayland? He boomed admiringly. Ah, oh, luck is good to Rayland. For twenty years I, too, have shown them in the laboratory how fear, guilt, every emotion causes in the body reactions, which can be measured. But do they apply it? Poof! No. It remains to them all impractical, academic, because I have only nincompoops in my classes. Professor Schmeld, said Trent, following him into the laboratory and glancing from one to another of the delicate instruments with keen interest. Tell me along what line you are now working. Ah, oh, I have been working for a year now experimenting with the platysmograph and the pneumograph. I make a taste, I make a smell, or I make a noise to excite feelings in the subject. And I read by the platysmograph that the volume of blood in the hand decreases under the emotions and that the pulse quickens. And by the pneumograph I read that the breathing is easier or quicker depending on whether the emotions are pleasant or unpleasant. I have performed this year more than two thousand of those experiments. Good. I have a problem in which you can be of very great use to me. And the platysmograph and the pneumograph will serve my purpose as well as any other instrument in the laboratory. For no matter how hardened a man may be, no matter how impossible it may have become to detect his feelings in his face or bearing, he cannot prevent the volume of blood in his hand from decreasing, and his breathing from becoming different under the influence of emotions of fear or guilt. By the way, Professor, is Mr. Welter familiar with these experiments of yours? What he? cried the stout German. For why should I tell him about them? He knows nothing. He has bought my time to instruct classes. He has not bought pie chimney, everything, even the soul God gave me. But he would be interested in them. To be sure, he would be interested in them. He would bring in his automobile, three or four other fat money makers, and he would show me off before them. He would make his train bear, that is me, dance. Good, cried Trant again excitedly. Professor Schmelch, would you be willing to give a little exhibition of the platysmograph and pneumograph this evening, if possible, and arrange for President Welter to attend it? The astute German cast on him a quick glance of interrogation. Why not? he said. It makes nothing to me what purpose he will be carrying out. No, by Jiminy, not if it costs me my position of trained bear, because I have confidence in my psychology that it will not make any innocent man suffer. And you will have two or three scientists present to watch the experiments, and you will allow me to be there also and assist. With great pleasure. But, Professor Smolge, you need not introduce me to Mr. Walter, who will think I am one of your assistants. As you wish about that, pupil of my dear old friend. Excellent. Trent leaped to his feet. Provided it is possible to arrange this with Mr. Walter, how soon can you let me know? Ah, it is as good as arranged, I tell you. His vanity will arrange it, if I assure the greatest publicity. The more publicity, the better. Wait, it shall be fixed before you leave here. The professor led the way into his private study telephoned to the president of the American Commodities Company, and made the appointment without trouble. A few minutes before eight o'clock that evening, Trent again mounted rapidly the stone steps to the professor's laboratory. The professor and two others, who were bending over a table in the center of the room, turned at his entrance. President Welter had not yet arrived. The young psychologist acknowledged with pleasure the introduction to the two scientists which Schmelch. 
Both of them were known to him by name, and he had been following with interest a series of experiments which the elder, Dr. Annerley, had been reporting in a psychological journal. Then he turned at once to the apparatus on the table. He was still examining the instruments, when the noise of a motor stopping at the door warned him of the arrival of President Walter's party. Then the laboratory door opened and the party appeared. They also were three in number, stout men, rather obtrusively dressed, in jovial spirits, with strong faces flushed now with the wine they had taken at dinner. "'Well, Professor, what fireworks are you going to show us tonight?' asked Walter, patronizingly. Schmelch, he explained to his companions, is the chief ringmaster of this circus. The bearded face of the German grew purple under Walter's jokingly overbearing manner, but he turned to the instruments and began to explain them. The Mary pneumograph, which the professor first took up, consists of a very thin flexible brass plate suspended by a cord around the neck of the person under examination and fastened tightly against the chest by a cord circling the body. On the outer surface of this plate are two small bent levers, connected at one end to the cord around the body of the subject, and at the other end to the surface of a small hollow drum fastened the plate between the two. As the chest rises and falls in breathing, the levers press more and less upon the surface of the drum, and this varying pressure on the air inside the drum is transmitted from the drum through an airtight tube to a little pencil which it drops and lifts. The pencil, as it rises and falls, touching always a sheet of smoked paper traveling over a cylinder on the recording device, traces a line whose rising strokes represent accurately the drawing of air into chaste, and whose falling represents its expulsion. It was clear to Trent that the professor's rapid explanation, though plain enough to the psychologists already familiar with the device, was only partly understood by the big man. It had not been explained to them that the changes in the breathing so slight as to be imperceptible to the eye would be recorded unmistakably by the moving pencil. Professor Schmelch turned to the second instrument. This was a platishmograph, designed to measure increase or decrease of the size of one finger of a person under examination as the blood supply to that finger becomes greater or less. It consists primarily of a small cylinder so constructed that it can be fitted over the finger and made airtight. Increase or decrease of the size of the finger then increases or decreases air pressure inside the cylinder. These changes in the air pressure are transmitted through an airtight tube to a delicate piston which moves the pencil and makes a line upon the record sheet just under that made by the pneumograph. The upward or downward trend of this line shows the increase or decrease of the blood supply while the smaller vibrations up and down record the pulse beat in the finger. There was still a third pencil touching the record sheet above the other two and wired electrically to a key like that of a telegraph instrument fastened to the table. When this key was in its normal position, the pencil made simply a straight line up on the sheet, but instantly when the key was pressed down, the line broke downward also. This third instrument was used merely to record on the sheet, by the change in the line, the point at which the object that arose to sensation or emotion was displayed to the person undergoing examination. The instant silence which followed Schmelz's rapid explanation was broken by one of Walter's companions with the query. Well, what's the use of all this stuff anyway? Ah, said Schmelz bluntly. It is interesting, curious. I'll show you. Well, one of your gentlemen, said Trant quickly, permit us to make use of him in the demonstration. Try it, Jim. Walter laughed noisily. Not I, said the other. This is your circus. Yes, indeed, it's mine. I'm not afraid of it. Schmelz, do your worst. He dropped laughing into the chair the professor sat for him, and at Schmelz's direction, unbuttoned his vest. The professor hung the pneumograph around his neck and fastened it tightly about a big chest. He led Walter's forearm in a rest suspended from the ceiling, and attached the cylinder to the second finger of the plump hand. In the meantime, Trant had quickly set the pencils to bear upon the record sheet, and had started the cylinder on which the sheet travelled under them. End of The Man Higher Up by William McHurk and Edwin Balmer Part 1